I appreciate all of you coming out. Thanks, Monica. This um, is like one of my favorite trainings to do, and I'm very, very, very pleased that all of you showed up here today because this isn't one of those where you have to check the box and you have to go to the training. So the fact that you're here meant that you really wanted to be here. And so the fact that we don't have like 50 people isn't really important because those who really want to be here and engage are here. And so we're going to have um, some really good, interesting dialogue. And although I do have some information and I, um, I'm no, by no means an expert, and really the expertise is in the room and you're, you're going to be surprised by how much all of you know and how much you're able to share and how much when a community of people get together and we share the little bit that we have, the, how grand the knowledge is and how good the outcomes are. And so, I, again, I thank you for showing up today. This will be hopefully a really good um, opportunity for you to not just sit and listen to me on womp, 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 womp. And that happens. There are times where I get in these trainings and I'm thinking folks are going to engage and they don't. So I end up being that talking head. So promise me we won't have that today. We're going to have some fun. But um, I also want to introduce one of my colleagues, my staff, Ardell Bailey. So Ardell is the newest member of the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations. And anyone who can say Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations 20 times fast without hyperventilating gets a prize. So, and Ardell's role is a youth services coordinator. So Ardell works, will be working um, within our facilities and our communities, helping youth with transition services, helping to um, plug them into specialized services and to identify helping um, parole officers and staff identify what are the needs of our youth when they go into communities and how can we help them have better outcomes than what they currently have. And so Ardell is like shopping around for services and resources, volunteers, everything from churches to civic, any other type of civic organizations in order to help youth have better outcomes. And we know that, especially in our transgender and our LGBTQ communities, here in Oregon, we're very, very fortunate in that we have a lot of resources. There are a lot of resources out there, everything from the biggies of Basic Rights Oregon and some of our community college and university resources to the Q Center in Portland and some of the other great organizations. And then some of the organizations that none of us even know about. There's a lot of very small little clusters of people that are just great resources that are out there to help our LGBTQ community of youth especially in order to make sure that they have better outcomes. And one thing that we know about Oregon and Oregonians is we do care about our kids, right? We care about the outcome of our kids, we care about the education of our kids, and we're, we're willing to invest in our kids. Maybe sometimes it's not as much as what we would like to think we should, but we do. So for me, let me tell you a little bit about me. So as Monica said, I'm the interim director of the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations. And prior to that, I was the regional manager at the um, Oregon Employment Department for 15 years um, for WorkSource Oregon up in the Multnomah County and Washington County areas. And so I managed all things WorkSource and economic development related up there. But I got a call and asked if I wanted to join the family of OIA for equity and inclusion. And because my real heart is that I'm a community advocate and I um, have done everything from served on boards at churches to I'm on the um, executive board for Providence Medical Group. I also um, speak nationally and internationally for the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care out of Bethesda, Maryland. And I go around and a lot of the um, collaborative and advocacy work that I got into was in the area for, um, for kids and for transgendered youth in particular and trying to make better health care system for our transgender youth and our LGBTQ community. Because communities of color and vulnerable communities have poor outcomes in health care. And if it's one thing I believe is that everyone deserves good, reasonable health care. I'm not a health care professional. I actually got called into doing that work by my doctor through my own chronic um, illnesses and some of the advocacy work that I did for myself and then got caught up into that. And you know, sometimes you just don't ask, things just happen and you get on that wheel. And so I've been um, serving and going around the country and advocating and I've worked with um, groups as large as the Stanford group down in San Francisco to Boston Women and Children, St. Jude's, La Bonner, um, some huge systems. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to have these interactions and to be able to see what we can do as we go around the country, specifically in the area of healthcare um, for LGBTQ youth. And so when I came to OIA, one of the areas that needed some support was our um, 
uh, TG, what we called our TGNC, our Transgender Gender Nonconforming Committee. And there was another individual who was working in that, and she was about to end her rotation and go back to the Department of Corrections, and they were looking for someone to step in. So of course, I was like, I will, I will, I will. And um, so I stepped in, and boy, it was just amazing to see that in a juvenile justice organization that the level of care that was there. It was amazing to me the heart of the people that were in the room, and I just felt like that OIA was going to do something really good and really positive, and I wanted to be a part of that change. And so I jumped on board and met great people like Monica and that committee, and um, we took off. And so as our need has grown, we have attempted to grow with it. I am by no means like an expert expert. I have lots of people in my life that um, identify so any, somewhere on the spectrum of LGBTQ, um, friends, family members, um, associates, and, um, and I just have a love of people. So we're going to get started today, and um, let's see what we can get out of this. Please do me one favor. Jump in anywhere you need to. Ask the questions. This isn't a wait to the end of the, of the discussion type of training or discussion. It really is um, designed to be very interactive. So a few things we want to think about as we get started. We're going to ask ourselves a couple of questions. And we can answer these out loud. So how many of you have ever thought, is this youth LGBTQ? Have you ever thought, I wonder if this kid I'm serving is gay? Or are they straight? So you not, heads nod, but you kind of don't know what to do at times, right? Those of you here, because you're here, you probably do, what, do know what to do. But a lot of our colleagues out there, they don't know what to do. They have that question. And, and a lot of things lead them to asking those questions, right? It could be mannerisms. It could be the way they walk. It could be the way they talk. It could be the clothes that they wear. It could be any number of things that make people just have that question. It's the unknown. And it's where do you go with the unknown? So how many of you are or know of a colleague who's uncomfortable talking about sexual or gender identification of the youth you serve? Got some nods? Cool. And do you believe people think negatively about the LGBTQQI people, especially trans people? Tell me why. Anyone? Yep. Why do we spend state taxpayers' dollars on this stuff? Mm -hmm. Let's get these kids out of that out of that jail and get them back on the right path. All mm -hmm. sorts of things. Some other folks. You have some. Someone want to. Someone else want to comment on that? Why do you think folks think negatively about it, if they do at all? Well, I think it, it's a play off of what you said. It comes down to a lack of understanding yes. from outside sources. Mm -hmm. and Exactly. Whatever it is, religion, how you were raised, what your community is. Perfect. That, that community. Yep. In my experience, that's exactly what it is. It's normally the fear of, of, of the unknown, right? Like, I don't really know what, what can of worms I'm opening up if I open this up. And the fear that if you open up a can and you don't have the resources to do something with the information inside, then you failed the person that you've made this, this declaration to or identification of, right? And so there's a lot of fear out there. So is there anyone here that's really comfortable with this subject? Really comfortable. OK. Good deal. That's good to know, because what that tells us is that you're surrounded by people that are resources. They're at least comfortable enough to ask a question, right? They're at least comfortable enough to take a stab at an answer or to look for a resource. Maybe, you know, no one's saying comfortable enough to go up and grab a kid and frisk him and say, hey, hey, what are you, this and that. But you're at least comfortable enough to be able to reasonably articulate what a concern might be or what direction you might want to go in or have some idea on how to be a resource to someone else. And then, is there anyone here that's really uncomfortable? I don't think so in this room, but you'd be surprised in the trainings that I give, there normally are, and within OIA, especially in some of our GLC populations, 
where we have a lot of people and a lot of turnover and we do, you know, have a lot of temps and stuff. People come in, they're like, I'm scared. I don't. And the fear, again, is the unknown. It isn't that they're afraid of the people, afraid of the kid, or even afraid of the lifestyle or choice, if that's what they choose to call it. It's that they just don't know what they don't know. And it's easy to be afraid of something that you don't know if you don't seek to get some knowledge in it. And so that's what we're going for. We're going for knowledge. So we're going to take a look at kind of what happens here. So we have our juvenile justice system here on the right. And then we have our LGBTQ identified population on the left. And we have you as either providers or foster care families or OIA staff, care staff, or whatever it is that your role is. And we stick you in the middle. So we have these gray big things called, these big entities, the juvenile justice system that has what? Policies, procedures, rules, laws, all these, these mechanical pieces, right, that just kind of chug along, these big old systems. And then we have a very vulnerable LGBTQ identified community on the other side. And in that community, what do we have? We have adults, we have youth, we have folks that are very positive and secure in who they are and what they are, and then we have folks who just have a feeling, we have folks who have a notion, we have you know, kids that have been persecuted for who they are or what they believe or even being an ally for someone. It's, it can be almost as dangerous to be an ally as it can be to be self-identified within the LGBTQI um, community. And so what happens is as staff, typically when I say this as staff, get stuck in the middle and we say, okay, guess what? Take the folks in this community that you work with in this big old system and do something with it. But the, the fear that I have and that we all know exists is that we don't get a whole lot of instruction, right? We don't get a whole lot of information and we don't get a whole lot of support in order to make anything that's, that's real or that's meaningful happen. And so when that happens, then there's confusion. And then that leads back to that unknown and that discomfort because if the organizations that you work for don't really put systems in place and supports in place to help you with that community, then you don't really know if you're doing things right. And so you're kind of always going off of a gut feeling or an instinct. And although that can work at times, it also could get you into some trouble. And so a lot of folks say, I don't really touch this. I don't touch this when it comes to kids especially because you know what? I need my job and I don't want to mess up. And if I mess up, I know what's going to happen. They're going to come after me. All it takes is for me to say something that is considered to be insensitive or something that um, some kid takes as offensive. I catch a kid on a bad day and yesterday we joked about something and today I went on with that joke and now that kid is offended and here I am now sitting down with HR in the union. And so, and when it comes to that, guess what? Hands off. They can be whatever they want to be. OIA, you can let them do whatever they want to do, but I'm not touching it because I need to pay my mortgage. And so it's not fair. It's not fair to those of you that are out here doing the work that we not work to put together systems, processes, procedures, rules, policies in order to help you to better serve that community because you are stuck in the middle of it. And it's growing every single day. Every day, our LGBTQ population continues to grow within juvenile justice systems. It is one of the fastest growing populations in the country in juvenile justice. It's growing, it's growing, and it's growing, and it's growing, and no one seems to know or realizes that it's going to continue to grow. No one knows how to continuously resource it because it also is kind of new to a lot of people, so it changes. Even the acronyms of LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQI, LGBTQQI, they change it. And so folks just kind of say, let me stay away from it because this is scary. It's scary. Does anyone have any type of information or like to share something that they have identified that within the system they work in and working with youth that maybe that has caused them some conflict or some concern or an area that you think is really important that we should be touching on? Yes. Um, there, we're in an agency that we need to know some things um, about a person. 
person. Um, so how to balance safety and security between one's confidentiality? Yeah, just as Monica said, confidentiality, balancing that with safety and security, balancing all those moving pieces, it can be hard. And we need to figure out how we do that. What types of policies, rules, laws, procedures do we need to put into place so that U.S. staff can share the important information that can really help a kid, right? Versus keeping it quiet, keeping it to yourself because, you, again, you don't want to violate a kid. You don't want to violate your system. You don't want to violate, you know, all of these things that are happening. But you need to be able to get information from person A to person C if, person B is going to be providing a service and we need to figure that out so that's something we're going to talk about a little bit about and I'm going to give you some resources at the end that can help you and guidance and maybe how it is that your organization or you can suggest that that happens so one of the things that happened in OIA is back in 2016 OIA adopted a position statement and this happened after a lot of conversation about what we were doing for our LGBTQ youth and who, who knew about it? And honestly, Monica helped to stimulate that conversation. And she and I and our past director were sitting down and talking about this because the right hand didn't know what the left hand is doing. And you can do a lot of good work. And if no one really knows where you stand on it, all, you're, all it can look like is that you're spinning. And so OIA decided that we would adopt a position statement that would let the rest of our organization know where it is that the leadership of OIA stood when it came to this population. And so I'm going to go ahead and read it here. And it says that OIA provides an inclusive, safe, and positive human development environment for all youth, including those that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and intersex. OIA, in collaboration with youth and community members, help create communities, opportunities for emotional growth and community awareness. OIA supports and fosters an environment where LGBTQQI youth can develop and explore their self-identity. Therefore, OIA offers LGBTQQI youth access to the following, health and wellness information, apparel and appearance resources, cultural events, and youth development activities. So we put this out there, and it was amazing. We didn't hear a whole lot back. We didn't hear a whole lot back. Although a lot of people were wondering where we stood, we didn't get a whole lot of response on it. So, do you know why, but someone did ask a question, like, why, why would we put this out there? Why? Does anyone have any idea why it's important that we come up with, what, that we had a position statement for this population? Oh, oh, go ahead. To validate the needs of all individuals. Yes, I heard something over here. Yes, absolutely. And I always say, it's one thing to know that you love someone, it's another thing for them to hear it, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know that. Like if any of you have partners or spouses or you have children or something, it's one thing to know, like you know your family loves you, we think we know they love us, but it's a, it's a whole different thing to hear it. And so we thought it was important that not only employees knew the position statement, that our youth knew that, they knew that we cared that we really were working toward building a better, more open and inclusive environment for them. So that's our position statement. We're going to take a look at a couple of definitions. And we all know that these definitions change, they morph, and I even have another sheet over here that I'm going to give you later on with definitions. But as we talk about transgender, and we're going to look at transgender is a term used to describe people whose gender identity differs from the sex the doctor marked on their birth certificate. Gender identity is a person's internal, personal sense of being a man or a woman or something outside of that gender binary. And recently here, as we are embarking on writing the OIA rule, we've looked at uh, defining transgender as a person whose gender identity is different from the person's assigned sex at birth. So just keep it that simple. And that's one of the things that we struggle with, that in this population and with this su uh, subject matter, the definitions change. They morph because we're learning more. We're realizing that this isn't just about a feeling, right? That there's some science behind this, the biological, um, 
feeling the biological um, work of the human body and the way that the mind works, that this just isn't how any individual feels. And so the, uh, the definitions are changing. And then we're going to take a look at who we're talking about. We're talking about any youth within the juvenile justice system that identifies anywhere on the spectrum of LGBTQQI, specifically those, today we're going to talk about specifically those that identify as transgender. And our transgender population is a very vulnerable population. And that's one of the reasons why we focus this topic, this conversation on transgender, because we're a lot more comfortable with the term of someone being gay or someone being lesbian, and even someone being bisexual. But when we start getting down into intersex and pansexual and queer and questioning and transgender, there's always that kind of drawback. And again, it's new, it's fresh, it's raw. And so we really want to make sure that we're getting information out there. And within OIA, within our locked facilities, our most vocal population of youth on this spectrum are our transgender youth. It's, it surprised me. I thought it would be our, our um, gay male population. But really, we have more transgendered youth that are fighting for what's right than any other of our population on this spectrum. And we're doing a lot of work for those transgender youth. We're doing everything from making sure that we're providing adequate clothing for them, gender-affirming clothing. Um, we're doing hormone therapy. We're taking a look at what does gender-affirming and appropriate housing look like. We're looking at reassignment surgeries and how does that work in a juvenile justice environment. So it's a population that has a lot of needs, a lot of needs. And as a, as a juvenile justice organization that's focused on PhD, we want to make sure that we're doing right by these kids. Because the very worst thing that we can do and that any of you could do in your organizations is have any of these kids leave you worse than they were when they got to you. That's the worst thing that we could do. So tell me what you know about transgendered youth population. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Homelessness. Do we know that I think um, we're going to hear in some of the slides something like 40% of youth that come out to their families get booted out the house. Their families don't accept it. That's not what we teach here. You're going to be a man under my roof. Sorry, we don't have that here. Or that's an abomination. It goes against the faith of everything that we believe and you have just got to go. And so we know what happens when they get booted out. They start doing what? Self-harm. Yes. They do self-harm. They do survival sex. They, have, they get into drug use and abuse. And all those things are what turn into that big old ugly well that lands them with us. And then they're in a system where it may be a little shallow to say, or maybe too conclusive to say, maybe with a little bit of love and a little bit of patience, they might not have landed there. I mean, if they're getting kicked out, they may not have landed there. there, there that may be an answer that within our, our family structures that we need to take a look and stop and think about what it is that we're saying and how we say it. And we're going to talk a bit today about how we say things. So what are we talking about? Basically, when we're talking about how to treat this community and how to treat these kids, we're talking about caring, we're talking about civil rights, we're talking about community, we're talking about culture and humanity, human rights, respect, and risk. And so all of those seem to make sense up there, but the only one that may be given at someone a little bit of question may be what? <coughs> risk. But it does take some risk because we have to risk as a society, as a culture, as organizations, to think a little bit different, to do things a little bit different, to ask questions that we haven't asked before, to accept answers that we haven't had to accept before, and really to take a look at this population of youth so that we can make sure that when we go back and we weigh these other elements in there that we're doing the right thing. And when we're talking about these things, I just put these up here because I think it's kind of 
you know, in, in, the, in the spirit of defining things. You know, we're looking at community, being a fill, feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Culture being the beliefs, customs, arts, etc., of a particular society, group, place, or time. Humanity is the entire human race and characteristics that belong uniquely to us human beings, such as kindness, mercy, sympathy, human rights, the moral principles or norms which describe certain standards of human behavior that are regularly protected. Civil rights, the rights that every person should have regardless of his or her sex, race, or religion. And respect, it's a way of treating or thinking about something or someone. And again, it's not about acceptance. It's all about respect. Because for a while, there was a lot of talk about acceptance, right? Well, I could accept that. Well, who am I to accept it or not accept it? You know, who are you to accept it or not accept it? It really is about respect. It's about how do you respect who someone is, who they say they are, who they believe they are, if they're not violating you or violating society and allowing them to be the best them that they can be. It's about respect. So let's talk terms. Any of these terms ring a bell with any of you? Have any of you ever used these terms? Talk to me. Tell, give me an experience where, where, you've, gone, where you've had to um, navigate yourself through a pronoun scenario. I know someone here has. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of conversations about it because going into an environment where it's new, people make a lot of mistakes. And so yes. that individual who identifies differently struggles with choosing their gender, and then that can kind of hurt that relationship if there's not open communication about what it means to them. Yes, exactly. And we're seeing that it's, it's a more common conversation than people might think. It's becoming more common to see it on the bottom of um, signature lines for emails where someone will declare what their pronoun is, what their pronoun preference is. Um, honestly, one of the first places that I saw it on a signature line was my daughter. My daughter works for a social service um, organization and she sent, I got an email from her and at the bottom it said, preferred pronoun, she, her. And I said, huh, interesting. I was like, so my daughter's name is Dorian, and I said, so Dorian, well, why, what, what's this about? And, and she said, because my name is Dorian. And a lot of times, people, there are males named Dorian, there are females named Dorian, and people send me emails, they send me letters, and they say, dear, dear sir, <laughs> you know? And she's not offended by that, but she thought, oh, you know, she works for an organization called Momentum Alliance, and they work with kids, and she said, I'm going to put, start putting this on there and see what response I get. We do this in meetings. We go around. We introduce ourselves, and they tell their pronouns. And she said, I just thought I'd put it out there. And she got so much positive response that they all started putting this on there. But we're seeing this be more common. And it's one area, a very foundational area, where you can show someone that you respect who they are, that you'll take the chance, and you may mess it up right? You probably will mess it up, but it's okay. What happens is that when you try, you get credit. And the more you try, the more people know that you care, and the more grace they'll give you, and the better you'll get at it. And so as you're going around and you're working with these kids, one of the things that you can do when you begin to have dialogue with them is to ask them the question. And you can say something as simple as, how are you doing today? My name is Bryant. I go by he, him pronouns. How are you doing? What's your name? And that can be a door opener where they would be willing to share that with you. And if they don't, don't push it by all means. But it's one area where, especially in the transgender community, it can really open a door and can gain you a lot of ground, a lot of ground simply by addressing someone by the right pronoun. Because the biggest thing that we have in our life is who we are. And when we know that people respect who we are and they, they openly will identify you the way you want to be identified, 
you're going to get build a lot of um, positive ground with them and build some really meaningful relationships with these kids. And that's what's important because we all know that with young people, if you aren't building a relationship, you really aren't building anything. You can sit down with all of the policies and procedures. You can have all of the rules. You can have all of the questions. You can have all the boxes checked. If you haven't built a relationship with them, you haven't done anything because they're going to go away. They're going to forget everything you said if they identify and use she, her pronouns and you've sat the entire meeting and called that individual he, him. That's the only thing that's going to go through their mind is that, oh, I can't wait for this is over so that I don't have to continue to be disrespected. Because more than likely with young people, they won't stop you. They won't stop you and say, will you do me a favor? I really identify um, and use pronouns as he, him, or she, her. They'll just let you go on and on and on and your relationship with them will just continue to deteriorate. So we're going to talk a little bit about how OIA works with trans youth. So we have a couple of areas that we work with trans youth, and one is in facilities, the other communities, and then in policy and rural development. So we kind of have built, um, built ourselves up a little area here for facilities. We do support and education. We also have resources for um, the Prison Rape Eliminate, Eliminate um, information. We do special, <coughs> excuse me, special request facilitations. So within um, our locked communities, we have a document and a process that we've put into place for our youth to be able to have, to submit a special request. And that can be anything such as, um, I want to be placed in gender affirming housing. I like to be called by this specific name. Um, one of our, our biggest requests happens to be to wear gender-affirming undergarments because it isn't publicly displayed to anyone. It's a way to still have something on you that makes you feel like you. We have quite a few biological males at um, our facilities that request female undergarments. And our facilities have the ability to purchase these items for them or allow them to use their funds to purchase items through Amazon. But we're, and it's a slow process. We also have to make sure that we don't do anything for our transgender youth that we wouldn't do for the uh, biological youth. So there's this weird kind of game that we have to play there that if we have a biological male that identifies as transgender at um, our male facility, we can't give them anything that we wouldn't give a biological female at Oak Creek. And we can't allow them to go further in any area than we would any other youth. And so although we will take special requests, we have to make sure that we're walking that line of equity there. Healthcare access, health education is big. Making sure that as these young people have requests that we're giving them information so that the requests they're making, um, they know something about. The um, legal age of consent for healthcare in the state of Oregon is? 15. 15, yes. So kids, young people don't have to have parental um, approval for a lot of their health care needs after the age of 15. They can make some decisions. Is that right, wrong, or indifferent? We could argue that another day. Some folks would say that's crazy, but in our state, that's what it is. <clears throat> we give youth trainings. We have staff trainings and special events. One of the um, things that OIA is really proud of is the fact that we hold a pride event and a coming out event at our McLaren campus every year for like the past four years, five years now. And it's a really big event. We have community members come in. We have folks from the transgender community. We have um, folks come in from the gay community, from the lesbian, bisexual. We have the media there. We give out information. We give out healthy, um, healthy sex ed tips. Um, you know, all sorts of things. It's a really well attended uh, event. It's the one event where our LGBTQ community kind of gets to exhale. We don't have a whole lot, but we do have those two events. Um, but our Pride event is the biggest of the two, and they're really, 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 really growing and really loving the fact that it's one of the events where a lot of community comes in, and it's that connection piece. And we get a lot of volunteers that um, sign up after those events, and so it's a good event for us. In communities, we have uh, program training and education. 
of staff resources. So the biggest staff resource that all of you have is the staff at OIA, so all of us. All of us are at OIA are tasked in order to make sure that in our community programs and in our foster care homes that we help you to meet the needs of the youth that you have, um, that we've placed with you. And it's important for you to, re to remember that, that if ever you have a question or you have a concern or you need some information, don't ever forget that you can always come back to us. And um, my office, my staff, the um, Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations, that's a primary, we're a primary resource for you. And we don't get called upon enough. And we know that there are needs that are out there. And part of that is, probably don't know we exist. We don't do a very good job at getting that information out there. It's one of the reasons why partnering with Monica and going around and making sure that we get that out there because it's important that you know where to go. And not knowing where to go and not knowing that you have a resource when you have one is a bad thing. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that you have that information. Um, there's participation in our um, TGNC um, committee. We have um, resource identification. So our YSC staff, which Ardell is, is part of the staff that will help to identify resources in the community. Um, community awareness, we've done some work and some advocacy um, support with KBU Radio, and um, we have our parole and probation support. Um, our policy and rule, so in 2016, we began the development of our first um, policy related um, specifically to our LGBTQQI community. Um, we also have moved into a rule um, development and adoption stage, and so our rule and our policy are almost done and they will be done this year. So we're really excited about that. We will, um, we're going through our internal process now of writing it and vetting that through the Department of Justice, through our attorneys, and then we'll be vetting um, both of those documents through our um, strategic and, and um, community partners. We'll be enlisting um, the resources of basic rights and of other organizations out there to take a look and see um, how, what they think and how they feel about these rules and these policies that we're coming up with. And be before the end of 2017, we will have these documents complete and our staff will have better guidance and they have better resources. We'll be able to have a clear message to the LGBTQQI community that we take this topic very seriously and that we um, have some clear established guidelines and expectations. But one thing that I always tell our staff when it comes to um, the policy and rule development because we went around the state and we started training um, our locked facilities in, in doing this training. And one of the questions that came up constantly was, when is the policy going to be out? We need a policy to tell us how to do the work. Well, I'm like, okay, I see what's happening here. And so I told him, I said, so policies are good. We know they do help guide and direct work, but please don't ever think that a policy is going to take place of you thinking and doing what's right and knowing that policies don't cover every scenario and every situation. And we know that there are some folks out there that that's what they believe is that, well, if it wasn't covered in the policy, I don't have to do it. And we're saying no, policies are foundational guidelines. They help direct the work, they guide you, but they don't take away the expectation that you are a living, breathing, intelligent adult and human being, and you're not going to utilize a policy to get out of doing your job. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Transgender Gender Nonconforming Committee, it's because that's our primary resource within OIA. It's the committee that comes together um, that's made up of our facility staff, a medical team, psychologists, we have all sorts of folks that are on there, our partners at the Department of Corrections, parole and probation staff, and even ad hoc members. Um, this group meets um, monthly now, it used to be quarterly, so now we're meeting monthly to talk about the concerns, the needs of our youth and of our organization. We track um, and discuss incoming youth requests and needs. We look and collaborate with our PREA coordinator, um, addressing the needs of our agency. It's interesting the um, uniqueness of the needs of a juvenile justice environment, right? All of you work with these kids. The needs are not like a public school. 
You know, we have these, we have needs that come in from our kids that are more personal. They're more intimate. They have more depth to them. And so trying to meet those needs sometimes can be challenging. And there are a lot of voices, as you can see around the table. And, and those voices are strong voices and they're strong advocacy voices. And so the needs that we have out there are really big. Talk to me about what needs your organization finds it has when it comes to um, helping the youth that you serve. And placement's a biggie. I know that we just um, recently opened up Rivera House. Um, and Rivera House is our first um, program that um, is specifically designed for our youth that are anywhere on the LGBTQ um, spectrum. So it's male and female, transgender, um, gay, lesbian, bisexual. And we're excited about that. But it is, it's, it's a unique thing and especially I think in the foster home environment where families don't know and, and, and kids come and on top of all the other concerns and needs and complexities that they have in their situation, all of a sudden this gets tossed in and they're, you know, they say they're for males only, but all of a sudden you have, you know, a transgender male there, you know, that said, and they say, well, no, this is a female, this is a girl. And she's like, no, I identify as male. And what do we do? And we haven't, I don't think we fully have answered that. And for gender fluid. Yeah. Uh, pretty much all of our programs identify as one specific gender. And if you have an individual who's fluid, then the last thing we want to do is one day say, well, you can't be here. And then that would be the very last message. Yeah. But there, there is some, some question about how to proceed moving forward with that type of a, a scenario. Yeah. Because what, is, what do sleeping quarters look like then? Does it mess up the foster uh, care provider or the program's ability to make money if all of a sudden the, the housing needs to be broken up where you can't have like, you know, two boys or three boys in one room. All of a sudden now you need these separate rooms. What does that look like? Or do you need them? If we all identify as male, what are you saying to me if you isolate me and move me to a separate environment? But what triggers are there if for the others, if not? What harms can, can happen? We know that, you know, if you're still biologically male, we had to answer this question recently with um, one of our youth um, that was looking to l have some um, um, gender affirming housing. We got asked, asked questions like, can this youth still get an erection? Can this youth, um, you know, um, is he still um, fertile and can produce, um, can fertilize eggs? I mean, we got asked some really serious questions about that. Like, so you're looking at moving what appears to be a biological male into a female environment. What harms could be there? And how do we as systems answer that? Well, we don't know all the answers. And we, you know, we tasked ourselves with what does that look like? Well, what's really happening here? We had questions that came up of the age. If, if this youth is in our system and they're 19 or 20 and they want to be moved to a primarily female environment and we have young females that are down there that are 13, 14, 15, what, what's really happening? Then the big question always comes up, what if they're faking on you? <laughs> That's the one question we pretty much have an answer to no youth really ever fakes being transgender. I haven't seen it yet. I'm not going to say it can never happen. I'm sure it has happened somewhere. But typically, you won't find young men in an all-male environment who want to declare that they're female in front of all of those men and be treated like female, knowing what the outcome could be. It just typically doesn't happen. Same thing when they talk about bathrooms. 
Like if this person identifies as female and they go into a male restroom, what if they violate a woman in there? It could happen. We know that could happen. And that's a real concern, especially for females. Like who's in this restroom with me in my most vulnerable state? But typically it doesn't. But it's a real concern and it's a valid question for us to continue the conversation and continue to challenge ourselves with. You had something with well, that. Mm-hmm. Or if they had not done that, then they kind of team it and figure out where they're going to best fit. And I know that in one case, we had a person who identified as male who had made the transition from mm-hmm. the female that was placed on the men's floor, but because of all the ridicule that she had gotten, her person turned him on the men's floor, we placed him on the women's floor, uh, where he was totally fine and you know got along with everybody, and there wasn't a big hassle. So that was case by case. Yeah. And I think that's really what it comes down yeah. to. Yep, and we do. Um, in all of your environments, it is. That's important to treat each one of these individually. That there is no such thing as a collective decision making around all transgender kids. That's the biggest mistake that you could have. And even in a large system like OIA, we make sure that we treat each and every one of these youth as individuals. And even within DLC, when they go and they staff for housing, they treat each one as individuals. They don't say, well, you identify as transgender female, shove them off to a female facility. It just doesn't happen. And so it's important to know that when you do that, not only are you showing the respect, but it's also a best practice. Don't begin to think that you can just lump all of your transgendered youth into one bucket and say, this is how we're going to treat you all, because each one is so different. Even on the spectrum of how far a person goals within their lifestyle and the way that they transition and how they want to be viewed or treated. It can be everything as I identify as transgendered. No one's ever going to know that. And maybe it's just me in my own personal undergarment wear to full transition to if I'm a female and I identify as transgender, I may only have top surgery and I may never have bottom surgery. Or if I'm a male and I'm transgender, I may only take um, hormones and I may only, and I may accept the changes that happen when I introduce those hormones and estrogen into my system, whatever happens, all the way to I want full transition. And so the spectrum is so long and so broad that you can't take any population, any group like this and throw them into one bucket. I just put this up here just to show Um, And I do this for our staff, and it's actually a little bit longer and goes a little bit more wacky, that we have quite a process. We're we're state government, though. (laughs) So we're good for putting together a process. But we have quite a process when it comes to making a decision and how that happens. There was a misconception amongst some of our staff that all these kids have to do is ask you guys for something, and Bryant, you just make it happen. I'm like, no, that isn't how it is at all. We vet these things quite extensively. And we take way longer than we should, right, Monica? Way longer than we should in order to make a decision. And so I show this because it's important not only that we validate and we do what's right by these kids, but those of us that work with them need to know also. We need to know that your voice is valuable, your perspective is valuable, the voice and the perspective of our communities are valuable. Everyone has a place within this. But I just want you to see that, and we don't have, we're not going to read through them by any means, but there's a lot that goes into um, like one single request for a youth to make um, a request to OIA. And if I could, Brian, when, yeah. the, when TGNC first started meeting, we were getting requests from youth for um, uh, pronouns and names. And we went through the steps and the process, and it took way too long way too long but now our staff feel empowered to just make it happen at the initiation so with time and familiarity um, the practices and the standards that OIA is putting out there are starting to really just become the way it is 
Yes. And in this time, we hope we don't have to have a, a TGNC or a formal process. It's just like, that's just what we'll do. Yeah, that's the goal. And Monica's right. We used to have these things like come to us and like, I want to be known, I want to be called, um, my name is Mike, I want to be identified as Michaela. And then we brought up to this group. And we was like going through, well, why do they want to be called Michaela? Well, what's the standard for this? And what's that? And all this stuff. And we just talk this stuff to death. Oh, I mean, really, it, it's sad when I think back on it. We're just talking it to death. It's ridiculous. And now we're like, don't bring that to us. If a kid wants to be called Michaela, especially if that's how they're known when they come in, if that's in the community, call the kid Michaela. By all means, they're going to help with the relationship. They're going to have a better attitude. And again, it's their identity. It's who they are. And if they're comfortable with other youth calling them Michaela, and that's what they're asking, and they're asking the staff to do it, then do it. The only obstacle we run into when it comes to names is that we have to let our youth that are um, DLC youth know that when they go into the DLC system, DLC is going to start calling them by the name on their order. No matter whether they have it legally changed or not, whatever the name is on the order, that's what they get called. But that's part of the process that we've decided that we're going to adopt is preparing them for that and letting them know that you're, you're, you're going to be going into DLC in whatever time you're going to be going. So we want to prepare you to be prepared for that. When you go back, when you go into DLC, they will be calling you Mike. They're no longer going to refer to you as Michaela. So what do we need to do to prepare your heart, mind, body, and soul to be able to absorb that? And what is it that we can do as an agency with your QMHPs and with your staff and with your whatever your supports are, just prepare you for that. And it really was that simple. But it still, even knowing that, it wasn't enough for us to say, sorry, when they get to DLC, they're going to be called Mike. We better just keep calling them Mike. It just wasn't enough. Yes? As OIA uh, worked in conjunction with DLC, that forms some kind of simulation of care for this population when they we do a little bit um, just in the transition, but once they're with DLC, we don't have a whole lot of say. We, However, they do go on, on the committee. Bill. Oh, the new bill, bill, yes. The new bill, and they did acknowledge that um, whatever steps OIA had done with the youth prior yep. to coming to DLC, they would continue set through. A yes. So I took that to mean we get to tell them a little bit. Yeah. And I'm tremendous yeah. opportunity for us to kind of say this is how we are. We need yeah. to suggest you need to do And I believe the new bill allows us even to um, to utilize financial resources mm -hmm. to help them out once they um, go into the DLC. Well, you know, if the DLC PO um, finds that this kid has a need and they don't have the ability, that we have the ability to access DLC, um, OIA resources in order to continue to help out, you know, DLC youth. But that's not just transgender, it's just DLC youth in general. But it, it'll benefit our transgender youth. Cool. One of the things also that um, I wanted to say about, I was thinking of something I wanted to say about um, our TGNC and how we have, um, how we've grown in the way that we do business. Um, we do, at, when we're at the table with our TGNC committee, we have a lot of players there. And so we um, have youth that have needs from all around the state. And what's been really good is that recently um, we've continued to bring in the voices of their POs. And it's been very interesting and it's been very enlightening and empowering to see that the POs within the OA system have taken real ownership of the um, transgender youth that they have and real advocates, that they're really coming forward and, and raising to the cause, rising to the cause for these kids. Because one of the concerns at first was that, you know, we could do all we can do for these youth within the facilities, because they have each other and they're kind of encapsulated and closed in their captured population. But our kids in community, no, no appeal is gonna stop and take time. And that isn't what we found at all. And the reason why we expanded our, um, our meeting times from quarterly to monthly was to accommodate our POs. And they have been, they've been showing up. 
and they've been advocating for their youth and it's been you know a really good situation so you know when you're in your programs or you know in your foster home environments don't be afraid to task these kids POs talk to them really share with them if we are not talking it's important that you talk because if they don't know then they don't know to advocate for them and because we're finding that a lot of them most of them are coming to the table and really are being vocal and helping to meet the needs of their kids you're going to do your kid an injustice if they're in your program and you're not talking to their PO so I'd just like to encourage that to if it hasn't happened to stimulate that and if it has to continue to massage that and make that um, relationship a deeper more meaningful one just quantity it has to be gender aligned so if you have a youth who feels that they do not have appropriate clothing that is one of the simplest ways that we as an agency can support that youth is providing the money for them to go shopping and get a gender aligned clothing yes let's talk a little bit about what your programs your organizations can do to maybe shore up or get a little bit closer to being a little more friendly or, or responsive to the needs of these kids. One of the areas is confidentiality. All right, as Monica mentioned earlier, like who gets what information, where, when, and why? So it's important that as organizations that you find a way to develop processes and policies that answer the question for confidentiality. And be able, it's important to be able to talk to your kids about it because this is a population that's really sensitive and wants to hear that you value their confidentiality because they feel like, and they are very vulnerable and in very scary situations. And if they feel like they're giving you information that you'll give to any old Joe on the street, they're not gonna give it to you. And so put together policies and be able to discuss them and make them as simple as possible so that you can talk to these kids about the fact that when it comes to your medical information, we won't be sharing that with X, Y, Z. We're, this isn't going to go to this person or that person. It's important that you know that we only share this when necessary and where necessary. And that, to you, that means blank, blank, blank. That anyone doesn't get a chance to come in and even share, put things into place like have a locked file cabinet, simple things that make sense. Like, as you can see, we keep these types of files over in a locked file cabinet. So I just want to assure you that we're going through this assessment. This assessment's going to be locked up. No one's going to just readily have um, access to this and get their hands on it. Talk about, you know, the, again, the information sharing, the information handling. Build rapport. So important to do things to help build rapport with these youth. It's important to make sure that you're um, focusing on the areas of physical and emotional safety. Kids want to know that they're safe. They want to know that you care. They want to know that you have things in place in order to keep them safe. You know, what do you do in your programs, in your organizations, to help these, keep these kids safe? What type of language do you allow? How do you address that? Let's talk about that, because language is a big deal, right? Because here at OIA, we give a cross-cultural communications training, and it always comes up language. And one of the things that we hear a lot that comes through our, our professional standards is that um, we have young men that get called fag and gay and all sorts of things in very negative ways, and they feel like it, it isn't monitored enough. We always have the, the N-word question. Like, why are kids going around using the N-word, and, and why are folks being allowed to say this? All these things come up, right? I saw folks smile. It's, a, it's an issue, isn't it? <laughs> Every single day. Every day we deal with it with our kids. And in this population, they have, we all know the derogatory terms that folks use. So it's important that you're able to have those discussions and create the safe spaces to have them. Have those safe spaces. We'll bring these kids together and talk to them about what do they need. And sometimes we sit down as adults and we start scripting out all this stuff. And we start saying, guys, guess what? We got it together. 
And I always work on the premise when I work with healthcare agencies, I always say, nothing about them without them. Don't write policies and procedures about people without them. Hear their voice. Let them have input. If you write something about someone without them, you're probably going to miss the mark. And even if you miss the mark, but you've done it with them, at least you all have owned it, right? And you come back to the table together. But if you write it without them, without them and you mess it up, and then you call them to the table, then it feels like, oh, great, now we got to fix your mess up. And the first thing folks will say is, you should have come to us in the first place. They don't well, respond. They, they feel not empowered yeah. to say the right thing or to intervene. Mm -hmm. So what can we do about that? Tell me about any experience you have with that, because that's a big topic. We hear that from kids all over from, from our lock facilities to programs that language is so big and it's so powerful. It can be either empowering or it could just tear you down. Talk to us. Let's talk to each other about some of the examples we have where maybe there was an opportunity to do something better, or maybe you did something better. Maybe you stopped something when it came to language. Name calling, anything like that. Yes. Um, I deal with this basically every day. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes kind of combative, right? And they want to show off and win. Yeah. Yeah. Consistency in it, too. Every yes. time we hear it, I Consistency. think there's some members who even acknowledge it, even if the, they use the thing they respond appropriately, at least acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. So everybody else around knows that we're, we're acknowledging it. Yeah. And not just letting them do it. Yeah, absolutely. In areas like this, consistency is so vitally important because if ever they feel like they can get away with it, they will. And if the, you are consistent with giving the message that, no, that's not acceptable here, it's not how we do it, it's not what we do, and we're going to call you on it, we're going to be respectful to you, and then we're going to have private one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're going to sit down, we're going to coach, we're going to counsel, we're going to do whatever we have to, up to and including stopping this. But you'd have to let it be known up front that you're in control of this and that you're not going to allow these things to happen. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard, first and foremost, because well, you have turnover, right? So it isn't like you're raising your family and the three kids or two kids you have, you get to raise your whole life and, and still in there what you want. And even then, believe me, it doesn't always go the way you think. But these kids, it's, there's a turnover. And there's a turnover in staff. And so to be able to have that consistency is really tough. And so to have those messages out there and to have things that remind folks are important and maybe even to have meetings where you mention those things and you're talking about it and you're just keeping it, you know, light and meaningful and sharing the pain and the hurt that it can cause an individual, right? That no one wants that. And we always have this thing come up when we do our cross-cultural communications training about the N-word and, and uh, there's always a staff, usually a staff that says, well, these kids tell me that that's their culture and I don't have a right. I said, you tell any of those kids, Bryant said, go call their grandma that and see what happens. <laughs> They're going to find real quick, that's not their culture. They're just pulling that over on you, and if they feel they can, they will. Yes? I agree that the one-on-one -on -one approach is usually like the best like, tool if somebody tries to call you out in a group setting becomes really uh, escalated quickly. And oh, yeah. Mm. Um, which is always very interesting to see what they come up with. Um, I also think that Coyote uh, does a really good job at leading group discussions regarding um, house issues. So after doing a one-on-one, -on -one, we'll do a morning group the next day just to approach that subject and say, hey, these are, these are these issues, and kind of get people to provide feedback and their own thoughts on it, and having those really open conversations to to just reiterate to not only that one individual who maybe used the word, but get everybody in on the discussion and see different perspectives um, yeah. Yeah. from whatever that may have been. Perfect. Yes, Kaylee. Yeah, I feel like um, one of the things that's really changed, and like not just on, on this,
this topic, but like main health issue, and with working like an all male population, one of the main ones that we have struggle with their assignments is um, in relation to females and like the dialogue they use around women or women's bodies and, and having like open conversation where it is not shameful. And then like finding an opportunity later on to have a follow up. I feel like it's really easy for clients to be like, oh, I just got pulled in to Kyrie's office and had a talking to. But finding the next day or even later that day, depending Mm -hmm. to that same consistent dialogue yeah. um, instead of just like I'm saying hey but it was the language yeah and again it goes back to building that relationship right mm -hmm. and the attentiveness and you know doing that one on one rapport building so that they know first and foremost that you're serious and you care you care enough not only to call them on things that are not healthy you know and that isn't just about the person that they may have said it to but it's about their own health their own well-being their own maturity and their own growth and talking to them about that, about the things that are in their life that are sensitive, that they wouldn't want anyone ever calling out or disrespecting or degrading and being able to bring those connections together. Because the one thing that we can guarantee is that we're all humans, right? So we should at the very minimum have a humanities connection. And so to be able to reach a kid at that very human foundational level is important. To, and it can really open up doors and having those conversations will build you um, relationships that are very meaningful. You know, um, being non-judgmental, you know, again, it takes, it takes a risk for these kids to be able to say the things and display themselves the way that they feel they really need to. And you put yourself out there. And if you ever want to kill it, be judgmental or allow other people to be judgmental. So taking an approach of how to not be judgmental of the lifestyles of, or the terms that they're using. Listening is a biggie. We all know that. If you just sit there sometimes and listen to a kid, say, hey, let's talk. And listen to what they have to say. will help you build um, great rapport. Humor is big. I always love the humor piece. Find a reason to laugh and to smile. You know, find a reason to laugh at yourself. Find a reason to laugh, you know. But with sensitivity, don't go in there and laugh at the thing that you know is really meaningful to them. Like, oh, I can't believe they laughed at the fact that you're transgender. <laughs> no, not good. And, but, you know, there's a way to incorporate some humor into the daily activities in life. Another one, another area for a lot of our um, programs is staff diversity. Does the staff represent the population of youth that you serve? Are there folks, when you recruit, do you take the opportunity to look around your organizations, look around the table and see what's missing? See who do you need to put at the table that can help make for a richer, more fulfilling environment? Do you have staff that represent the transgender population? Do you have staff there that represent other populations, both ethnically and on the scale of LGBTQ, that represent the youth that you serve? And if you don't, you can have some challenges. And we know that's a challenge in a predominantly all white state, not all white, but predominantly white state, that can be a challenge. It can be a huge challenge for ethnic kids. It can be a huge challenge for, and God forbid if you're ethnic and you're on the scale of LGBTQ, then you really could have some issues. But there, it can create some real issues. So take the opportunity when you have it, when you're doing staffing, to see what do you need to do in order to reach other groups so that your staffing models are, thank you, are in alignment and represent the youth that you serve. Where do you need to go? If where you've been advertising gets you the same population every time that you interview, take a look at where you advertise. Take a look at where you're going in order to find your staff. And also take a look at what skills they have. What skills? And when we talk about staff diversity, look at a diversity in skills. You know, do you need someone that is a good facilitator? Do you need someone that 
um, someone that can bring some, some laughter into your workplace. All sorts of skills that are out there that when you have opportunities to hire staff, you should take a look at because having a diverse staff where these kids can go and find, get different perspectives and utilize different skill sets is going to be really vital to their development and vital to their outcomes. And again, safe spaces. The spaces that these kids are in, that you have, you can develop some safe spaces. See what you need to put together so that the kids feel safe talking, so they can feel safe sharing their information in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one so that they can really grow and mature into the young people that they want to be. And then create atmospheres for learning. Ask valid questions. You know, again, we, we talked earlier today about, you know, hi, my name's Bryant. I, you know, I, I identify as he, him. How about you? You know, not, what it, Ardell and I were talking this morning and, and Ardell asked the question, how just, what, how, do, you, what do you identify yeah, as? What do you identify as? <laughs> Whoa, human. <laughs> you know, you be careful, you know, how you do that. A lot of times just sharing something about yourself in, in that same way and then bouncing that back off of them will help get a really meaningful answer. Again, you know, listening, share your learning. When you leave here today, hopefully you have heard something that is an aha moment or a little bit of learning for you. And you can share that. Go back and share with the kids. When people know that you've spent time, your valuable time, investing into learning something about them or that can better them, again, you gain yourself some mileage. To go back and say, hey, I went to this training today about um, transgender youth, and it was a great training. You know, we heard some great things there, and we're hoping to put some things in the place that can really help us be a better organization. Just a general statement like that. Of course, you're going to have, you know, those naysayers on the back. They're always going to exist. Don't think they're ever going, to, going away. They will not. But the empowering that you will have happen with those that need it, and you may not even know that they need it, but you have youth and you have staff that need to know that you're investing time and energy and resources into learning more. And then challenging the status quo. You know, don't just do it just because you've always done it that way. It's time for us to look a little bit different, look at things different, think about it different, and challenging just the way that we process all of this stuff that we have coming at us.